Welcome, everyone, to the uh, February 2022 uh, Blue Meeting. Uh, uh, Randall Schwartz will be speaking, uh, talking about, um, what's that, the uh, flood or something? Uh, flutter. Just, just flutter. flutter? Okay. Just flutter. Yeah, well, dart and flutter. Dart indirectly, though. Okay. Yeah. Uh -oh. Go ahead, Randall. Oh, okay. Well, that's it. Easy, then. I'm going to start sharing my second screen and hopefully it'll work it'll look all completely blue for a second and uh let me switch to that so i can actually present on that where is it there it is so oh i guess i'm not playing let's play you think i know how to do this after years of being a professional trainer huh all right uh and actually just before i start i want to say that uh Many of you know me for my Pearl escapades uh, and having written a few books that people tend to like and then having the world's largest Pearl training company for most of the dot-com boom. Uh, well, I've still been doing Pearl up until about a year and a half, two years ago when I became a Flutter Google developer expert. That means I went through a special rigorous screening and I get to add GDE to my presentations. Some people really enjoy that. Uh, I wrote this talk as a uh, to be a, uh, present as a GDE to one of the flood meetups. So that was uh, preaching to the choir a little bit, but it was sort of fun to fill in some of the background. And I presented an earlier version of this talk at uh, Scale, Southern California. Uh, and I was standing on stage with... Uh, Wim Leeler, who was a worked for Google as a DevRel and uh, a GDE, by the way, is an unpaid position. I basically unpaid DevRel and I have to publish or perish. I have to go out and do things from time to time in order to uh, continue qualifying as GDE. So this talk also going on my record as a, as a couple of points for this month, which is nice. Um, so I've been playing with Dart since it came out. I've been playing with Flutter since it came out. And I've been writing Flutter commercially now for about a year, uh, producing mobile apps for the first time. Uh, I, I had never thought of doing Android or iOS apps. But all of a sudden now, I've got clients that are asking me, I want this uh, mobile app, and also it's got to work on it's going to work on both iOS and Android, and if we can get parts of it to work on the web, that would also be even better. So I've been doing things that are much more fun now. I mean, Pearl's okay, uh, but once you've sort of mastered it, there's not really much of a challenge. I'm still mastering Flutter and Dart, figuring out new things about them every time. But what I want to start talking about is why this is an excellent platform to look at if you're using all platforms. So in the overview, we'll talk about first... What is Flutter? These are the upcoming bullet points. What does Flutter do? Uh, what experience do you need as a Flutter developer? And surprisingly little. We have people who, that are starting Dart and Flutter as their very first programming language. And it's like, wow, okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's called an array. <laughs> you, you might need to understand why you'd want an array <laughs> or a list. And uh, what's the range of apps? What can we build? Uh, and why I think Flutter is dominantly unique in the industry. So we'll cover those points. And also the big question that gets asked is why is this a mobile framework first and then a bunch of other platforms later? Why, why did Google choose Dart for building Flutter with? Dart was an invented language from a different project in the uh, Google environment um, called Angular Dart, which they still use internally. But why was it then chosen for Flutter? For uh, yeah, for Flutter. I'm um, talk about some of the notable adopters of this. So what I'm going to do first is some history. So starting talking about evolution of uh, vendor lock-in. So some of us are old enough to remember, probably most of the people on the call here, uh, ancient operating systems. So, for example, you know, the, the VMS and and uh, uh, someone in mind right now, DOS, well, DOS is an ancient, still all of everything. 
Um, but the thing about these ancient operating systems is they were written for the vendor or by the vendor for the hardware they were selling. So every one of them was different. And once you started coding for a particular system, you were kind of locked in uh, unless you bought a more powerful machine that was compatible with the previous machine. But you were kind of, you were locked into the architecture once you started committing to a particular vendor. And then you're also locked into that vendor. And the operating systems were generally closed source. For example, um, well, there, there wasn't an open VMS until there was one. And before that, VMS was closed source. So you kind of had to deal with the fact that uh, uh, if you couldn't figure out a particular um, API, you would have to submit a support ticket to the vendor and say, uh, how does this work? Or I don't understand this documentation. But yay, 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 the reason most of us are coding these days is we had the FOSS revolution, free Libre open source software. We had the BSDs and Linux and others. Um, and the good thing about that is if something was broken, then, oops, oh, got too many, too many buttons here. Oh, well, okay. I lose my professional presenting license just then. All right. Um, so customers could fix, they could extend, they could modify the operating system. And, you know, yeah, there might be poor documentation sometimes, but if you don't understand documentation, you can always go into the source code and go, does this actually work? And that was really nice. But the other advantage was that you could port it to new hardware. So instead of relying on the vendor's uh, operating system, you could have a copy of Linux that runs there with the, with the help of maybe other people. And the other thing was that because of free Libre open source software, for the most part, you can share your code freely with others. So let's say you take somebody's package and you make it do something new you can share that back. It's all open source, so everybody can get at it again. You can put in a pull request on GitHub these days. But more importantly, it was interesting because Linux sort of became de facto uh, API. And so you could write it once for Linux, and it seemed to run on extremely varied hardware because you might go from a single board micro uh, or like a Pi or whatever, the way up to supercomputers and would run exactly the same code because Linux was Linux was Linux. Made it much nicer that way. And so reasonably then, yeah, Linux became the open source API for cross platform portability because you write the code to the Linux API. Yes, you were compiling it with different compilers, but nevertheless, the API remained consistent across all the interfaces. Now, what's interesting is the mobile story for the last 10 to 20 years has been going through roughly the same steps as I just described for the big computers. Because for over a decade, at least a decade, the smartphone guys have been the early, just like the early computer vendors. So in other words, your phone apps, they had to be written with vendor supplied tool chains. And of course that varied widely between platforms. I still look at the um, platform side of Flutter, and I, I just I just roll my eyes. I'm glad other people are doing the work to make the main packages uh, portable, because I would not be able to do that. And I don't want to learn Kotlin. I don't want to learn Swift. I don't want to learn Java, you know, Objective-C. I don't want to learn those. And I, I think after listing something like 60 languages on my resume, I really don't need to put any more on there. So. Uh, so the vendor supply tool chains, they vary between the platforms, okay? And the vendor chosen languages then, you know, Swift versus Kotlin versus uh, Java versus uh, ARM versus all that stuff. There's, they're all chosen by the people who make the hardware, and rightfully so in the sense that, you know, they're, they're trying to build a top and bottom solution for you. And uh, but that puts imposition on the people who want to write software for it. And the APIs also vary. So there's nowhere near the same kinds of interface for um, um, for iOS as there is for Android. I mean, they're completely different systems. Uh, sure, there's a lot of sort of naturally uh, similar 
functions, but they're not line for line compatible. So, uh, and also um, the APIs varied from release to release. So that was also easy too. You had to think about, am I gonna target Android 11 or Android 12 or Android 13 or whatever? Uh, and what do I wanna make my minimum version be? And because they kept changing the interfaces all the way through iOS, same thing. Uh, they've tried to minimize the expense to existing uh, software providers, uh, you know, because they like the apps. They like the apps because it makes people like the phones. So the problem, of course, with this, the bottom line of all this is that when you released for iOS and Android, it required specialized skills rare or separate teams very typical and especially now that flutter has been out for a few years in uh, production applications something like 450,000 applications are in flutter on the android store now which is it's just huge it shows huge adoption rate but part of the reason is that instead of those particular companies having to have a whole team just for the ios and then just for the android they could uh, reduce their labor. We found some companies have gotten rid of 80% of their uh, devs. But the other side effect for this is that when you had two different code bases, you had two different bugs, bug databases, you had two different uh, update cycles. So you, you could never fully get all the way through um, having a one common look for your app. And that was also annoying. And of course, you had to have the two specialized teams to be able to fix those and update those and so on. Okay, so here's the talk. And here's what this is all about. Along came Flutter, and suddenly the game has changed. So what is Flutter? Flutter's a mobile app SDK. It is. Uh, it comes, batteries included, framework, engine, widgets, and tools, uh, and uh, continues to mature. Probably new releases of Flutter every three months ago. So they're really making it cycle. I often comment that if you are looking for training materials or just more enhanced knowledge about Flutter, uh, you have to look at the date of publication. And if it's older than six months, it's probably outdated already. So it's uh, it's been sort of awkward. I originally got into Flutter because I wanted to write some books about it and kind of repeat what I did with Pearl. But uh, I'm glad I didn't actually start writing a book because things are moving so fast. There's so much material out there that is outdated because the Flutter guys just keep moving faster and faster. And so what Flutter does is it gives all the developers in a, a, a productive way uh, to build and deploy beautiful apps, incredible apps. Uh, I'll probably talk about this a little later, I think. But... Unlike most other mobile operating systems, you have complete control over every pixel. So you can put widgets the way you want them to look. You can put uh, UI interfaces that look exactly like you want. Uh, you know, it's, it may not be easy. Uh, you have to learn how to use the drawing tools and stuff like that and have dynamic animations, pretty fun. And it's in production release for both iOS and Android and for, I think, let me think what this year is. Uh, at least a year and a half, maybe two years. Oh, Flutter 2 came out a year and a half ago. So it's probably like two and a half years now. So um, currently amazing. Um, but so it's iOS and Android. and But that isn't, that's what got it started, but that isn't all that it's doing now. Because uh, it was in a preview release for web and desktop. Web has finally hit stable. And desktop just hit uh, late developer preview which means it's usable, it's practical, things are being done to make it even better, and they've done a lot of stuff to develop these out. And what do I mean by web and desktop? Web is web in your browser. So while originally this wasn't to make cool animations on the web, I mean, if you remember back to the Flash days, and maybe even Java in the browser days, where you could have some custom UI, custom API um, for the web, and it would just take forever to download <laughs> and load on the first page hit. But uh, it would still be amazing. It would be like nothing like any of the other widgets on the screen or whatever. But what's nice about uh, Flutter on the web is that you take the exact same code base that you ran for mobile 
And 95% of that will just work straight across. You just run the same code on the web. In fact, sometimes when I'm testing, I'm testing a mobile app. I'm testing it actually on my, um, on my web browser because it actually compiles quicker for that. Uh, it turns out Xcode is really slow <laughs> for all the things I want to do with it. Um, so Flutter can be translated into Dart uh, and Dart can be translated into JavaScript, which is how that works, or Dart's travel translating into JavaScript. So that'll run in pretty much modern browsers. Don't need anything special, any special extensions or anything. It's just basically skewing out as JavaScript. And they're also working on a WASM compiler for it. So you would actually spit it out as a WASM file. And that will run faster and more powerfully in every browser because WASM is pretty much a standard now. But there's also the whole desktop game. And this comes in uh, two flavors. Uh, Dart itself can compile to uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. And that's a command line application. But Flutter also knows how to put up, um, you know, graphic interfaces with all those. In fact, the, um, the latest Ubuntu release includes an installer that transparently is actually written in Flutter. So they took the widgets that made up the rest of their TK toolkit that they use for all the standard displays and they uh, created them in Flutter so they could have reusable components. And so they're actually building almost all of their new UI stuff uh, with Flutter rather than with uh, TK or whatever the one was just before the current one. Um, and so that's pretty amazing too. Uh, same thing on Windows. They are they have Windows, um, the the name of it, uh, but the the win the standard Windows UI. They have uh, widgets that perfectly emulate that. And uh, so you can't tell that, you know, it's a, it's, it comes up in a window and it can have all the standard drop down bars and menus and resizing and all the stuff that you would normally find if you wrote it in the native Windows uh, uh, toolkit. Uh, what's funny is somebody came up with a Windows 95 skin as well. So you can have your mobile app on your iPhone look like it was done with Windows 95 which is pretty cool without a lot of work. I confused my client one day by sending him a version that's like that, but uh, I, I have too much. I don't have a time for all that. So, so now we're looking at multiple platforms. We're looking at iOS, Android, web, uh, desktop and windowed versions on Linux, Mac and uh, Unix or Linux. So, there's a lot of platforms this already applies to and pretty much the same usability, especially for the core things that have been around for a while, pretty much same usability for everything. And the reason they can port this stuff so easily is that the layering of Flutter involves one low level embedding layer and then a layer that essentially implements Skia. And if you don't know the, the, the Skia is the, rendering engine of, of Chrome. So it has all of those features built into it working well. So a copy of Skia is actually embedded in everything that Flutter is building. It's also used for Fuchsia and Fuchsia uh, wasn't known a lot about uh, at least uh, last year. And then uh, for those of, you, those of you that are familiar with these Google Home devices, there's sort of like a master controller for everything that's in your home, kind of like what uh, that Amazon company is producing, whose name I can't remember because, or I can't say out loud because this house has many of those devices. So I have to be careful what I'm saying here. Uh, and don't you dare yell out something a certain day. Anyway, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, so, so Go Home was originally written uh, Android based. So an Android uh, operating system, which included, you know, Linux, because it's Android is based on Linux. But now what they have is they have the new Fuchsia kernel, which is a micro kernel, no traces of Linux in it, except maybe some of the APIs for the legacy layer. But and now it's written in ARM directly. And it's written, um, it, a lot of it's written in uh, Flutter. So that's already being deployed out to retail, lots of people's homes. 
So this is a big change. And you really don't need anything as much an Android machine with a, running a Linux kernel to have uh, a reminder box on your refrigerator that you need these five foods when you go to the store. You don't need anything that complicated. So this is going to be the kind of interface that we would use for lower fidelity boxes, things that didn't have to be quite as fancy. And for example, GM has adopted Flutter as a key component to their new uh, education systems, uh, entertainment systems on, the, on their dashboards. So this is the kind of applicability that this has been uh, reaching. So very cool stuff. And, uh, and so there we got Dart's language can be to build all of these and they can build web applications. They can be server side. So think of, uh, if you're familiar with um, uh, Node.js uh, running, say, as a web server with plugins, um, the trouble with Node.js is it's running under JavaScript, which is dual threaded. And so you have to do tricks to be able to get multi-thread. Well, in Dart, there's a package called, uh, called Shelf written by the uh, Google team themselves. So it's maintained well, it has a lot of flexibility. Uh, well documented as well, and it could be a web server with multi-threads because uh, Dart is able to run essentially share nothing threads to be able to have independent activities on each of your cores, for example. So really, really cool stuff. So the nice thing is learn Dart once and you can develop for eight platforms, which is really cool. So what does Flutter do? For the users, again, it makes beautiful apps, beautiful UIs come to life. For developers, it really lowers the bar to entry for developing mobile apps, including not having to learn a lot of the details. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Hot Reload and how that really helps. And if we get time at the end of the show here, I can uh, actually do a demonstration of that. But what it does is um, it speeds up the development cycle mostly because it really is starting from scratch in order to create uh, a whole new framework. And you only learn that one framework once and you can use it in all the platforms I just talked about. So it really speeds up getting developers. They just have to say, I know Flutter. And it doesn't matter that they were doing Flutter on the web and you want them to do Flutter on your mobile or something because it's, it's all the same technology all the way across, unlike say migrating from iOS to Android. And so again, uh, cross-platform development is uh, reduced complexity, reduced cost, shared uh, bug fixes, things like that. And so you can have, for example, the original use case was a mobile app development team could do both iOS and Android. For designers, it's really kind of interesting. And these are the people that make things much prettier than I can do on my own. Um, and what it does is it develops, uh, it produces original design without compromises because you can have pixel product, pi pixel perfect layouts without having to work at it. It's, it's pretty easy to do that. Although if you want your design to be reactive, like for example, if you're building a design to go on the web, uh, you would want to react appropriately to someone making the web page wider or taller or whatever. And there are a lot of tools built in to Flutter to actually say, here's, here's how breakpoints work. So when this column is only 100 pixels wide, do a single column. But when it's over 100, 100 pixels wide, go to two columns. And that's all really trivial to do with Flutter. Very, very uh, easy to do. Um, and of course, then it's reactive to that. It would actually just repaint all the uh, columns that got moved and you can do whatever you want with that. But the other thing that is really nice for designers is that uh, with Hot Reload, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, you can iterate on a design layout uh, with, within fractions of a second. Like um, as, as long as you didn't change something really, really low level, uh, like maybe change some globals in your program. Uh, if you just change some code that's generating one of the widgets, you just simply save your code file and boom, within a second or so, you see the new layout. 
And it's also saving where you're going and what you did to get there. So for example, let's say you're five clicks into your app and you're already at some sub sub, sub page. And the designer says, oh, those buttons are too close together. Can we get a little space in there? You can immediately go, okay, here's Spacer Widget, boom, reload. And now it looks exactly like it needs to. And so you can have rapid changes with, uh, with the aid of a designer pair programming with you. Uh, my friend Wim, who got me into being uh, GDE, um, said that uh, he used to sit next to uh, designers and they would tell him to change it this way, change that way. And eventually they said, wait, I'll learn enough Flutter to be able to do this on my own. And so the, the, the designers were actually coding now. Uh, unlike taking it through a cycle where you use something like Figma to lay out your app, and then you take that and you say, here, uh, Mr. Programmer, please go through that and, and copy it over. No, you can almost, and I have been, using Flutter as its own prototyping tool. So you don't need to have a separate pro prototyping tool. You really can develop from uh, the initial default app all the way to your full app, uh, mostly just hitting hot reload, occasionally hitting hot restart, but that's, a, that's not that long when that happens. So what do you need to develop something like this? Um, well, since Flutter uses Dart as the primary language, it's a relatively modern, strongly typed language Familiar constructs, you know, classes, methods, variables, complex data structures, generic and type interface. So uh, if you're used to most of the stuff, most of the stuff was stolen from Java, but not the bad parts of Java. So it's actually, it's like a really nice Java. Um, and it, is, it has both imperative programming and conditionals. It has functional programming where you take a list and you apply a map function on it and it can do the same thing to each element of the list and gather the new list uh, on the output. Very, very nice like that. Similar to uh, grep and map from uh, Perl, if you're familiar with that. Um, it's really nice. And it also has asynchronous stuff through the notion of streams. So a stream becomes a connection that will generate uh, zero or more results. And you can then apply all these functions lazily to the output of that, uh, making it really nice for uh, really deep designs. Like going to Firebase for something, you end up with making like five or six or seven streams feeding into other streams, feeding into other streams. And then you finally get your result uh, without having to create a bunch of variables to put all that stuff in. Cool. And, uh, and also, uh, one of the features I like no prior mobile experience is required at all. It helps a bit when you have to think about things like how to be responsive, which is a lot harder in other languages. Flutter really has that down nicely. Um, or, and things like that. Uh, and also just what the mobile experience is like. You know, you do things differently if you have it on a desktop versus uh, how you'd have it on a mobile in terms of layout and structure and workflow, things like that. So you have to, it would help to know some of that, but that stuff you can pick up pretty quick. Uh, just watch a lot of videos. Um, so again, uh, even yours truly, me, uh, is doing mobile development now without having uh, uh, really any desire to do that prior just because it looks so complex to learn not only the iOS interface, but also learning Objective-C. Of course, now I can use Swift for that instead. But um, it's a lot simpler. No, wait, Swift is Java's replacement, I think. About Kotlin? No, Kotlin is Java's replacement. Okay. Anyway, but it's still not. Objective C was actually pretty nice. It was not much nicer than C++. So. Y yes, I will agree with that. But you could say almost anything was better than C++. Well, except, yeah, but except, that, that, yes, it is a low bar. But <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. It was sort of like uh, the old systems where you embedded database language before we called it sql inside your fortran or your cobol yeah, as an yeah. embedded language you had small talk embedded in your c and you knew when you were doing object oriented and you knew when you weren't doing object oriented because the syntax changed exactly exactly and i will say as a small talk aficionado from way back way back from 1981 yeah um i uh i did like that part of objective c but 
the continuing to have to jump the layers between C and Objective C was a little weird. So uh, it yeah, took me a yeah. long time to get most of it down. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Anyway, let me keep going here. So, um, and as I said earlier in the talk, even people with very little programming experience seem to be productive rapidly, which is really cool. I mean, that's that means you can spin people up that are only designers so far, or you can spin people up that are fresh out of school. That uh, you know, you got to be pretty pretty uh, conversant with things like, you know, what's what is an object? Uh, why would you use, uh, uh, you know, why would you use a closure? Because uh, that comes up a huge number of times in Flutter. You're almost always passing little snippets of code in closures around in the code. And uh, that has its own advantages and disadvantages. So what can we build with Flutter? Um, the designers said it's optimized for 2D mobile apps. So although uh, there are some 3D packages, that's not what the original design was about. The original design was basically to control all the pixels of your phone in a way that is cross-platform. And so, But this was the original target. And But what that gave it was the advantage of the capability of brand-first designs. In other words, you weren't limited, say, with something that uses uh, vendor widgets, like, say, a web app or uh, like the original iOS and Android. Apps you build for those often had to have a bias towards what the vendor had provided. If you wanted a drop-down box that goes up instead of down and the vendor didn't give you one, too bad, because there's no way to really extend that in any easy way. Um, but it's uh, but that means you can build an app that looks identical on iOS and Android. Uh, very, very cool. Or you can also use stock platform widgets. So there's a whole collection of widgets that use the material theme, and that's the predominant one that people use when they're building Flutter apps, simply because it's biased towards that. And no surprise, Google made uh, material and they have people continuing to research material and provide a standard material.io. If you go there, you see a bunch of things like this is how a button should look. And what's good about that is I'm not a professional designer, but I could always go to material.io and go, oh, yeah, I want one of those. And nine times out of 10, I just look for that same name in the Flutter uh, SDK. And there it is, because Flutter is a first class implementation of the material design language, which means that, and, it, and it's, they're all coordinating together. Again, that's Google talking to Google, which is great. Uh, so you will find always up-to-date strategies. Like one of the new things that got announced at Google I.O. Um, I think six months ago was this notion called Material 3, which allows a user's preferred coloring system to influence the colors of the widgets in their apps which I think is a little overkill, but I mean, it, it's one thing to have light and dark, but to also have my preferred color is green. Okay. <laughs> you know, and then have that influence all of your widgets in all of your apps, a little crazy to me, but that just got rolled out into flutter. So now if you want that material three look and feel, uh, it, oh, it's called material you also, I mean, you you material you um i think that's taken personalization just a little overkill but uh hey it's go cool. they got the money to do it so sure uh, but now now the widgets are starting to understand these nuances these uh these uh same things that are already rolled out into android so android i think got them first but uh but uh flutter is now uh, really close behind um so you can use all these material widgets but let's say you're building it for the iPhone market and you don't know if the users are going to go along with material looking uh, widgets on their phone. You can build using the Cupertino family of widgets. And that's what they're calling the Apple widgets. They don't want to put the word Apple in there. So it's Cupertino. So you can use a Cupertino drop down bar and a Cupertino text window. And they all look and feel exactly like they do on iOS. And it's interesting. I've heard stories about how they did that. The 
the, there are certain bounce effects when you're scrolling in uh, iOS and certain ways that the drop down button, button animates when it opens and closes. And what they did uh, is for both iOS and Android, they used high speed cameras uh, with people going through the various motions on the actual devices. And then they use the images in the high speed camera record to figure out what the equations were to actually define that particular layout. And it turns out that uh, they came up with an equation that was only a cubic equation for the way that Android bounces at the end of a, of a scroll. And when they sent that over to the Android team, they said, here's what we came up with. Is, is this close? And the Android team says, you know what? It's exactly the same as what we do, but the hard way. <laughs> so it's a, it's kind of funny what some of the results that have come out of this project. But they're really trying to get things really accurate for the mimic widgets. But you can create whatever widget you want. You can just build it any way you want. There's not, like I said, you've got control over uh, every pixel. And there's a lot of generic um, containers and widgets and uh, uh, generic layout widgets, and uh, even uh, even uh, gesture detectors. So you can say, when I swipe my finger from left to right on this screen, but only in this left half of it, it'll do this action. So it's very, very uh, uh, capable. Like you could make every square on a chessboard have its own gesture detector. So then if you press down on a, on a, a piece, and drag it to another square, it can tell where you started, where you ended, and give you the right callbacks for uh, updating the board or marking it not legal. Very Sounds cool. like if I wanted to be really evil, I could make a Android application that looked like it was on an iPhone and an iPhone application that looked <laughs> like it was on Android? You can definitely be mean and do that, yes. Yes. Uh, right now there's a another mean thing to do, but there's a... Um, a sliding 15 puzzle challenge that's currently going on with uh, real prices. Google's giving out money for this thing and, and uh, MacBooks and stuff like that. Uh, but they want it to be something that uh, has animation in it. So for those of you who don't know, sliding puzzle, uh, the 15 puzzle, I shall call it, it has uh, 16 squares, four by four, and the number 16 is missing. But the, it starts out all scrambled up, and you have to just slide different things into the empty cell to eventually switch it all around. Well, it turns out that if you just generate the numbers at random out of the pool of 15 numbers, there's a 50-50 chance it can't be solved because it has the wrong parity. And I was thinking about putting this app on my phone, and I would show somebody how it works and solve the puzzle. And then just before I handed my phone to them so that they could try it, I would have it detect that I've turned the phone upside down and then it makes an unsolvable puzzle for sure. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I didn't do that. I haven't that, didn't this, do that. There's a lovely mathematical theorem behind that that's extensible. Yeah, uh, yeah. So different it's, sizes. It's are dominoes cool. on chess boards and the like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a parody problem, right? Okay, so uh, so you can mimic the stock platform look and feel. There are also even packages in the um, the equivalent of what the CPAN is for Perl. It's called the pub, uh, continuing the Dart theme. Dart and there's darts found in a pub. Yeah, it's it's, it's bad. It's but they, they that's how it was first referred to by, for me. So, um, but there's a package that actually has you write almost no code to be able to write widgets that on an iPhone, they look like the standard iOS widgets and on an Android, they look like the standard uh, material widgets. So I don't even have to put a lot of work into that. Now, of course they restrict both of them to their common denominators because there are some things you can do in one uh, field, but not the other. So, yeah. Okay. Enough time in that bullet. Let's keep going. Um, so again, you have the ability to access full featured apps including the native services. So there are packages for pretty much everything you'd want to talk to. Camera, geolocation, getting on the network, accessing uh, device level storage. Uh, there's also third-party SDKs for all sorts of things and more, more and more every day. 
uh, I'm thinking there's about uh, something like a hundred new pub packages uploaded every day. Some are updates, but most of them are brand new and cover so many different areas. It's really, really, really remarkable. And if the thing you want is not in pub yet, it's fairly straightforward. I, I will refuse to use the word easy there, but fairly straightforward to be able to write your, your own package that has a common interface for both platforms and then wire that up to specific uh, self-written Java code or, um, uh, you know, Objective-C or Swift or whatever, or Kotlin, and be able to then publish that so that other people don't have to write a uh, low-level code. But you can get access to everything that the operating system can provide. So you're not limited to just whatever the Flutter authors wanted to do. And in fact, uh, as of five or six months ago, they added support for FFI on all platforms. So you can actually get into those interfaces without writing uh, any platform code. It just works. You just use FFI to hook up with the library there. So that's really nice. That's really coming along. Uh, who makes and uses Flutter? Well, so it's an open source project uh, to the highest degree that we can mean that, in that all of the code, uh, the code originally came from Google, but as of the, not the most recent release of Flutter, but I think one of the slightly earlier releases of Flutter, something like 70% of the code came from pull requests. So it means there is now a full ongoing community that isn't just Google. Google still controls the roadmap. And so again, uh, still heavily supported by Google, they're putting some large number of employees on both the Flutter team and Dart team. Uh, I don't know the exact number. Of course, I'm a GDE under an NDA, so even if I did hear the exact number at one point, I couldn't exactly tell you. But let's just say hmm, hundreds. We'll just stop there. Because it has now become important for Google's future in that uh, it's silly to put Android into Google Home. It's, that's, that's overkill. And also, Google doesn't control the Linux kernel. This guy that lives down the street here does. And so um, that's, that's part of the issue there. And so by having Fuchsia in place of Android for uh, Internet of Things, uh, it's going to mean Google can control the whole stack and, and uh, make changes to the whole stack, which uh, is going to greatly improve, I think, the devices as we go forward. Already... Um, a couple of uh, mobile phone manufacturers have talked about making Fuchsia their language of choice or their framework of choice for their particular mobile phones. So this is going to go lots of places. The other thing that was nice is that this also meant that they weren't using the um, Java interfaces uh, that got Google into trouble with Oracle. And I, don't, I, I forget, I think the latest one went in favor of Google but that doesn't stop Oracle from trying something else, a different angle for it. So uh, if, if Google moves completely out of the, uh, the uh, uh, realm of needing uh, a Java interface, so much the better, um, because then they can say completely out, away from that uh, lawsuit, because that could be very expensive if, uh, uh, um, if Oracle ends up owning a piece of every Android phone that went out, for example. That would be bad. So, uh, and like I said, community communication contribution as well. So that's nice. Uh, you know, three quarters of that release of Flutter that I just mentioned. And Google itself is using Flutter to build business critical apps for iOS and Android. Uh, so this is things that are related to Google products. Um, so you need a good mobile app to talk to uh, uh, AdSense and AdWords. Well, that was all done in Flutter. Very nice stuff. Um, mobile sales tools, things like that. So their mobile sales tool is done in Flutter. Uh, the store manager for your Google Shopping Express. And again, a large number of internal projects that even I don't hear about, even with my secret inside knowledge. Um, so it's already there. And then this says just thousands, but it's more like hundreds of thousands of apps. 
and that number is being tracked for the Play Store, but it can't be tracked for the Apple Store. Apple won't tell them how many apps are actually written in uh, uh, in Flutter on their store. And uh, but there is a trick to always figure out if you're on an app and you want to know whether it's written in Flutter or not. There is a bug that they will refuse to fix in scrolling with two fingers. If you pull down with one finger, it scrolls down. If you pull down with two fingers, the for some reason, the amount your fingers moved is added together, meaning it doubles the amount and scrolls down twice as far. And three fingers, it scrolls down three times as far. So... They're leaving that bug in just so they can see what apps are published on iOS that are actually written in Flutter. Because otherwise, there's no way to tell. So nice bug, huh? Cool. Um, also, one of the big early apps that came out, uh, I'm sure most of you heard about the, uh, the Hamilton uh, musical. Well, they wanted from scratch in three months, both iOS and Android, and uh, it had to be beautiful. It had to be uh, something that was usable by the audience or potential audience of Hamilton uh, attendees. And uh, this company in New York did it in three months from scratch with Flutter being one of the early strong adopters of Flutter and had some a lot of assistance from Google because they really wanted this uh, showcase to happen and um, ended up working fine, and it's still out there. It's still, I think, for something like some number of weeks, it was the number one downloaded app on the Google Play Store because it was incredible, and it still gets uh, highly rated, lots of stars, all that sort of stuff. So, cool. Why is Flutter unique? Because Flutter doesn't use WebView like you would have, say, in a React Native app. It also doesn't use... The, we call them OEM widgets, widgets that came with the operating system, like uh, you know a Cupertino button or a, a, a Material, whatever, right? So the, there's no when we're designing the app, when we're making use of the app, uh, unlike other platforms like Re React Native, where you sort of start with a DOM over on one side and then you build through it. And it has to go through some sort of gateways to talk to uh, physical I.O. And, uh, and things like sound and stuff like that. You're go constantly going through bridges for that. Flutter uh, basically is talking directly to all of its own pixels. So it doesn't have to talk to somebody about, I need to put a red square here. It's, it's all already in the skia layer of Flutter. And so that makes it faster. Uh, 60 frames per second on phones that can do it 30 frames per second on phones that only go that fast are typical very very typical so it's full speed animation full fidelity and so on and again like i said use a skia from chrome to basically render its own widgets and the cool thing about that especially as a budding programmer as a, as a serious senior programmer but but new to flutter is that uh Almost everything down to the skia layer is all written in Dart. And my IDE, I can point at a symbol name that I have, like the name container. And I don't know how container actually works. I don't quite understand the documentation about what parameters it takes. I just hit that button and I'm at the source code for container immediately. So I can see, oh, oh, I see this is what it's wanting. It's wanting a value of, of this range and so on. Or if I want something that's kind of like a container, but has my own features in it, one of the things I can do is I can uh, create a new widget that uh, composes in it a container widget, or uh, I can take the source code to container. If I don't think I can get it by inclusion, I can take source code to container and just paste it again and call it Randall container. And there's nothing stopping me from do that, doing that. It's because all the source code is always there available for stuff like that. Very cool. Um, and uh, there's a thin layer of C++ to talk down to the native APIs. Uh, but the Dart code also handles compositing, gestures, animation, and the frameworks, and so on. And this is great because, again, if I don't understand 
how the animation works. I can go in and see the details of it. Like I wanted to know the other day how the gradient color fill actually worked. How was it actually drawing all those pixels and be very smooth all the way across? And it turns out it's plotting it for every single point. It's doing a computation of the plots and it's fast enough because it's doing it, uh, some of it machine code, which is fun. But I saw what it was doing, it made it really nice. Um, and so everything is all high speed animation, good stuff. Um, and again, the code is easily inspectable, patchable, extendable. Um, subclassing something is pretty fast and, and easy to do. And again, uh, we can get a cross-platform look, look and feel easily provided, or you can customize the platform for, like I said, iOS behavior on iOS and Android behavior on Android. And like it automatically does a few things for you uh, via gesture detection and other platform dependencies. Like on an Android phone, uh, there is uh, the ability to swipe left, which is go back one screen, uh, presuming the developer enabled that, uh, which is enabled by default in Flutter. And then on iOS, there's that left arrow at the top of the screen to say go back one level. Been on hold for two years. My live streaming is on. Yay. And that sounds oh. like uh, that sounds like Allison Smith, the uh, the 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 girl from uh, from Asterisk. Could be. Yeah, probably is. Yeah, probably is. I've met her a, a few times. She's cool. She yeah. did a audio piece for me for uh, Floss Weekly. So that was cool. Um, anyway, so where are we at? Yes, we're on this slide here still. Um, so it, anyway, so you can basically have it look the same on both platforms, or actually on all platforms now, I should say. Or you can have it customized, uh, again, for a new feel. So like they're working out uh, native widgets for the web. They're looking for things that look and feel like the native widgets. Uh, so, you know, you could have it look like what Chrome has for widgets and so on. Pretty cool. Why Dart? Now, here's probably the most interesting question. Dart is not JavaScript. It's not any other language. It was invented by the Googlers, and they continue to um, uh, develop it. Uh, probably a new release of Dart about every six months with new significant features, like uh, about a year and a half ago, they went from sort of loosey-goosey typing to strong typing so that they can better inform the IDE what are the possible um, methods you can call on this variable and when is it going sideways when you're trying to put a string into an integer and so on. So that really improved the whole language, and I'm glad they did that long enough ago that nobody will have to go through the pain that some of us had to do when we went from loose typing to, to strong typing. Um, but basically, so the mobile team chose Dart based on a couple of features that are really important. Two of the critical ones is that in order to support this thing called hot reload, you have to have a just-in-time uh, compiler that can incrementally understand what text I've changed in my source code to know what needs to be changed in the binary to keep running forward. Uh, and so the great thing is shape changing, stateful hot reloads and so on, okay? But they also, for performance, needed uh, ahead of time compiler, AOT, that basically generates, and this says just ARM, well, of course it's ARM on iOS and Android phones, but uh, it would be native 86 for Linux or ARM now for you have a far enough advanced Linux box. Um, but basically it builds to the platform. It, it um, And it doesn't do it through intermediate steps. So it's basically the output of the uh, Dart compiler on uh, targeting a, a mobile phone. In fact, ARM code, it's not, uh, it's not a assembly language, a strict uh, machine language all the way down, which means that um, the compile can be relatively quick and it can be optimized in particular ways that make sense for, uh, for Flutter and Dart. So both of those are great. Both of those are really cool. Um, and you can also reuse code uh, in the pub. So the pub was originally set up, of course, for Dart. Uh, and then Flutter came along. And all of a sudden now, everything that we were using for Dart, like, for example, there's uh, 
uh, Pettit parser that's in there that basically you give a BNF like syntax written in and it can parse uh, arbitrary trees and make, put actions on them, kind of like yak and X together. Um, so there are these cool things that are pure Dart, but then they can also be used in every Flutter app because that's, you know, Flutter is a framework for Dart. Very cool stuff there. But um, I'd say most of the stuff that's in Pub now is Flutter related. Uh, also, the Flutter team and Dart team, of course, work both for Google. So the Flutter team can influence what Dart has in it. Uh, one early obvious uh, point was that uh, the uh, the new keyword, which was in early versions of Dart, was showing up over and over and over again in Flutter uh, um, uh, programs because almost everything was new on something that contains the pieces it's in. So, for example, you had a you had new scrolling list, which contains a new list item, which contains a new text item. And so new is showing up as probably being the every third word in a Dart program or in a Flutter program. So the Flutter guy said, is there any way to get rid of that word new? Uh, can we just make it optional? And Dart team came up with it and released it. And now there's hardly ever a new keyword anywhere which is really, really slick. It, it's sometimes you stare at it and you go, is this running a function here or is this constructing an object? That's the only thing you have to kind of worry about. Um, but the naming convention is that classes always begin with an uppercase and functions always begin with a lowercase. So that makes it a little easier to kind of visually uh, instantly identify it. So that works out really nice. So the Flutter team has influenced Dart over the years to be able to get better features for that. Um, and uh, again, AOT compiler, native binaries more directly. Uh, they've optimized some of that stuff and optimizing the VM for latency rather than throughput, which means that uh, you can get faster responses to hot reload and things like that. Very cool. And also again, strong, strong modes, the sound type system. Who's used this stuff? Uh, I'm not going to list everything that's on this web page here. It's flutter.dev slash showcase, which has uh, 30 or 40 of the companies that Google is featuring that are currently using Flutter. Uh, but a few of them I like to pull from there because they were all announced in the last Google I.O. Uh, my BMW, so that's the app to be able to talk to BMW about your car, I guess, or to other people about your car. New Bank, I don't know what that is. Tencent, big shopping forum or kind of like ebay that's what i've been told it's something like no maybe it's the communication network whatever it is it's huge this is one the tencent app has something like it's got to be the wrong order of magnitude but i'm remembering a billion downloads which given the population of china and it's the number one app from their store in china that kind of makes sense if you got apps and you've got a billion people it's kind of easy. All right. Uh, Google Assistant. So that's the code behind uh, uh, the thing that's in your uh, phone to be able to enhance your um, enhance your chats. Uh, Square. So that Square program you use if you're a Square vendor. Uh, that's also, also all in um, um, uh, Flutter as well. So just to sum it up, uh, the advantage of reactive views, no JavaScript bridge, so there's no DOM in here at all. Now, if you still have um, a web page that you want to include in your app, uh, like maybe the only way to get a, a two-factor authentication is to push up a web page, um, you can embed a uh, view, a, a web view, um, in your Flutter app. And it will take care of layering it properly, making it so it's hideable, showable, all that sort of stuff. You can even inject JavaScript into it to execute particular functions. You can even, uh, and I worked this out and it's been spreading around once I came up with my solution. You can even inject JavaScript that dumps the current HTML. So you can open up a web page in the web view, inject this JavaScript to say, show me the entire DOM and it can lay it all out for you. Pretty cool. Um, so, but otherwise JavaScript doesn't really come into play on the mobile. It comes heavily into play on apps uh, that are designed as web apps, uh, where you have uh, Flutter being the, the driver, um, in that there's great interoperability with the DOM when you're on uh, you know, a 
a, a web browser uh, in the way that you could have, for example, pass values back and forth between the JavaScript side and the Flutter side. And you can also, again, inject JavaScript that can trigger callbacks over on the Flutter side. So really great interactivity. Uh, you can edit the DOM, modify the DOM. I mean, I was actually writing programs the other day that uh, pulled up the DOM by access. And then I was actually injecting uh, LI values and things like that. So I could actually draw what I wanted on the screen uh, in a way that uh, would be uh, a little more flexible and cut, cut and pasteable mostly. Um, so again, fast, smooth, and predictable code compiling to uh, AOT and uh, from ahead of time to native ARM code. So that works well with mobile, but basically every platform that gets targeted, there is an appropriate uh, output from the Dart compiler. Um, and again, full control, pixel complete over all your widgets, all your layout. Uh, it's infinitely flexible because it's just code all the way down. Uh, and it comes with customizable widgets, beautiful widgets. Like I said, if you see anything on Material IO, the Material Design uh, website, you pretty much already have that widget in your um, in in your Dart uh, in your Flutter codes. Uh, codes. In fact, uh, on the Material IO page, you can actually click on the Flutter tab there and it shows uh, source examples from different languages and there's almost always a flutter one so you just take that flutter example cut and paste it right into your code and then build up from there so you don't have to think about how do we make a drop down button it's pretty easy uh great developer tools so they'll use out of the box uh, supported by google the uh visual studio code which i'm beginning to like more and more uh really extensible uh, and it finally got me away from emacs which is scary um, and they also support um, uh, uh, Visual Studio Consumer Edition. Is that right? No, no. Um, it's called something else. Something, something. Uh, whatever. Anyway, so there's three of them. IntelliJ Community Edition. That's it. And Android Studio. So you can choose what uh, IDE you want, and it all works pretty much the same thing. Uh, again, more performance, more cap compatibility, more capability, and more fun. And like I said, you can develop for all these platforms. Oh, I should update this. You can develop for all these platforms from one code base. And, but that's uh, insignificant compared to the other gains. In fact, I've told people, even if you're only building for Android, you should probably use Flutter just because of the hot reload. Um, it's it's going to be a lot better and more fun experience. So revolutionary. And for more things that you can look at and get information on, Dart.dev is the homepage for Dart and includes, excuse me, the throat was going bad there. It includes the tour, which we call mandatory because it's only about an hour long read. Uh, it basically gives you the overview of what does Dart have in it, uh, what it doesn't have in it, uh, although less complete at that. It's just, if you don't mention it, it probably doesn't know how to do that. And the library tour, so some of the key Dart libraries that you'll probably use in almost every program. So I usually tell people at least skim that. Um, and then on the Flutter side, we have lots of tutorials, code labs, uh, and then descriptions of all the widget classes. And there are a lot of them. Um, and the new ones keep popping up, which is scary to me because it's like, I, I've never seen that widget before. Um, they need a change log. Actually, they do have a change log because the website is done by Google, and they actually have that as a GitHub repo as well. Uh, that's the other thing I should have mentioned earlier, is that the GitHub repo for Dart and Flutter and the website and a few other tools are all using the issues from GitHub. So if you have a problem with the way Dart's working or the way Flutter's working, or you understand something, uh, you can post a, a, a GitHub issue on the website and say, you know, I, I don't understand this from this paragraph. So, and they're very responsive to that stuff. One of the first things that happens is somebody at Google is at least daily doing triage on all the new bugs. And so then they say, oh, this is a priority three. This takes a little bit of work. And this is a great thing for uh, a first-time coder, first-time uh, uh, submitter. 
And they're really good at marking all those. So you just then search down by tags and go, what's good for a first time uh, code con contribution? And that's all marked already. So uh, go check those out. So yeah, anyway, uh, so the GitHub is definitely uh, an essential part of the process. And some early documentation shows up there too. There's even a wiki that they uh, control, things like that. Uh, but it's all out in the end. Uh, so descriptions of the widget classes, uh, a cookbook, which I've referred to from time to time. Basically, I have a task to perform. How do we do that in Flutter? And there's about 40 or 50 worked examples that are all organized correctly. And again, as I said, code labs. So tutorials are basically just about reading something and finding things out. T code labs, get your hands dirty. You're actually given a task and step-by-step, uh, -step, you have to work your way through it. And any step, if you want to bail, you can just download their source code for that step and uh, move on to the next step. All API descriptions everywhere, everything. And that is the end of my slide deck. So if I've got time, uh, I can do a demo, uh, but mostly I'd like to start taking questions for a little while. So let me, uh, let me hide this away. Okay. So uh, questions. Everybody's quiet. Oh, what, what's a good uh, a good place to go to start uh, learning this stuff? Like uh, everything you just saw on, on that slide. I'll put that slide back up again in a minute. Um, but every basically start with the Google written stuff because one of the keys that they've done and they've done this very consistently is that they actually develop the all that stuff for the next release of Flutter and Perl in the background. So that when that release rolls out, the the website changes instantly on the same day as the release, and has all of the updated stuff. It's the only it's the only people that really can do that because only the people at Google know exactly what's going to be the next release. Uh, although if you watch the issues and the issues being closed on the various GitHub repos, you can definitely work out uh, which one's which. Oh wait, I'm not do that. Let's stop my sharing. There we go. You can't see me otherwise. Um, so, um, yeah, so if you watch the GitHub, watch the issues being closed, uh, you can kind of tell what's coming up. But the fact that the web team works closely with the Flutter and Dart teams to know what to have and what to write, uh, that really helps. The other thing you can do, and it is amazing how many of these are out there, uh, where you can just type in into video Google search and uh, look at... Uh, everything that says Flutter tutorial and maybe a particular topic because people are turning out something like 10 to 15 videos in English every day and probably almost the same number in languages I don't understand. So um, I used to watch all of them and so I would spend maybe one or two hours a night just watching the new videos. Can't do that anymore. Just too much stuff coming out, too many things to learn about. Uh, the caution I would make about that is, as I said earlier, that this thing changes so fast in six months that you really can't uh, anything that's older than that likely will have misleading information. Uh, maybe not outright wrong, but maybe there's already a faster way to do this. What this person lamented about in the video. So look at the pub date, try to get the latest one first uh, on video Google search. You can actually drag down a published within the last six months. And I'd highly recommend that for your first searches, just because you want to stay with the stuff that's current because it's it's almost likely correct instead of being uh, vaguely wrong. So that's what I would do. There are a number of commercial courses as well. So I think Udemy has them. Um, a couple of the big uh, video sources also has them. And again, if you Google for, you know, uh, Flutter tutorial, some of the paid courses might come up as well. Uh, I would caution against any of those. Not that the authors are bad, but they all of those are at least a year or two old, despite the one guy who updated his course to say, now updated for 2022. And you know what he did to update it for 2022? He changed the date to 2022. So you got to watch out for that. <laughs> be, be very, very cautious of that. If you have a question, ask me in any one of the social channels. Um, speaking of that, in Flutter.dev, there is a page, Flutter.dev slash communities, or community, I think it is. And in there lists uh, Slack channel or, or Slack server, 
uh, a Discord server. Uh, you can post questions to Stack Overflow, and it will be answered almost instantly. Uh, Reddit also has a pretty strong group of people that goes around and answer questions. Um, and often that's me. I'm going to all those places trying to somehow uh, help you all to get questions answered. Please uh, search for the answer first before posting the question because it might have already answered by somebody else or me. Other questions? Oh, is that a preferred backend platform uh, when, when you're developing apps? Doing what, sir? Sorry? When, you, when you're developing an app, all, all the stuff with Flutter and Dart is basically uh, uh, would be like the front end for applications. If you want to have a server back end, is there any like recommended uh, uh, preference for that? Well, you use anything you want if it, as long as it speaks uh, GraphQL or, or REST. So it's it's whatever you're familiar with, whatever you're comfortable with, because uh, Flutter can handle that really well. Dart can too for command line applications and and uh, desktop applications. Um, but there are if you want a complete stack in Dart from top to bottom, there's a couple of solutions. One, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Shelf is essentially a Dart web server that has a, a great architecture to be able to put middleware in it. And there's some good middleware that can fit in there and actually do stuff pretty well. Uh, there was a couple of other full frameworks. Uh, one was called Aqueduct and one was called... Oh, been so long since I've been able to play with it. But there are a couple of really big ones, and both of those got abandoned. At least Aqueduct has forked to become conduit. So there is a there is a somewhat full featured uh Dart backend. But like I said, you don't really need Dart on the back end unless what you really want is one language from front to back, which does have the advantage that uh as you as you probably realize when you're validating a value. You can't just do it in the front end because somebody could cheat the uh, the protocol and get past a bad value to the back end. So you really need to do both of them both places. And if you have a common language like Dart at both the front and the back, then you can share your libraries, share your packages that do the validation the way you want to, and uh, make sure that you do it twice. Make sure you do it the right way in, in both places. So that would be something to look for. But otherwise, no, use, use whatever you're comfortable with. Um, for back end, also, if you're uh, familiar with the big suite of applications and services that are being provided by Firebase or by their competitor, uh, AWS Amplify, um, you'll see that you can use that stuff all as your back end and get real-time communication and things like that. Uh, uh, all, all depends on what costs you want and what uh, and what features you'll need. Um, like, for example, if you want to send notifications to your phone, you're pretty much locked into using the notifications that come out of uh, uh, Firebase uh, 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 notifications because that's really the only place you can get that. Uh, ADB, AWS also offers you that. But they do it by contacting Firebase. <laughs> so you end up paying double. And that's because Google has locked down Android to receiving notifications only from Firebase. So crazy. Any other questions? Comments, complaints, suggestions? Oh, shall we fire up an actual uh, Flutter app? Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Okay, so let me uh, get all my stuff in place. Of course, now I enter the live demo field, and I don't know if I've paid enough tribute to the live demo god recently, but let's just share this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up code. Let's see here. Um, hopefully this won't bring up my current client's code. Hopefully we'll just bring up Visual Studio Code. And it's on the wrong window, of course. Uh, and guess what? That is all of my client's code. i got to hide that first. got to hide that first. Okay, now. Just as well, it went to the wrong window, though. Yeah, it went over here. Yeah, that's nice. Um, how do I get this on the other window? 
All I need to do tab it up to here and then drag this over. So this, if it eggs, come on. Are you going to drag for me? No, you're not. Okay, I guess I did it the wrong way. Okay, there. Oh, there we go. So this is Visual Studio Code. And what I want to do is open it on a particular directory. Uh, well, we'll just go to temp, I guess. Uh, code slash temp. I don't care if you know what the names of my files are in, in temp. Okay. Oh, and that opened up the wrong window there. That's crazy. Okay. Close that window. Open this window. There's my temp. How's that exciting? Look at that. And from in here, I can uh, create a Flutter project. Actually, I'm going to do it on the command line here. I don't trust uh, creating a new project here. So let's see. Open. No, 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 no. Oh, open the little window down here. Window. Use this is already open. Terminal. There we go. So here I am in the, the thing. If you ever used Visual Studio Code, you may notice I put the uh, files on the right-hand side because it actually feels more natural for me to do that because then it's really close to the other things I might do, be doing over here. So what we say is Flutter, create, PLU. And now it's going to build out the file system. And then let's do code blue. Code blue, how cool is that? That should open another window. Yes, there we go. So these are the files that come with Flutter when you build one. But the most important of this, well, there's things here for building the Android phones, uh, software, Gradle and stuff like that. Here it is for the iOS, bunch of stuff there that's all related to that. I hardly ever get have to go in there, it just works. The main code I want to look at in here is this right here, main.dart. And it's colorized, looks really nice. Is that big enough? Sure, should I make it a little bigger? And big and there we go, easier to see. Good. And this is uh, the code that almost everybody sees every time because there's really only one default to Flutter Create, and that's this. So everybody gets to see this. Um, I'm pointing that way because that, oh, you can't see me anymore. It doesn't matter which way I'm pointing. <laughs> Mess that up then, too. Okay. And the app is actually fairly simple. And I'm going to run this, not on my phone. It would run on my phone, but I'm going to run it on my simulator just so I can pull, um, I can uh, basically do this. I think this will work. Maybe not. Uh, what do I get? Uh, dark. Okay, that's there. How do I shrink that a bit? Um, Corners here. It's just there we go. Okay, I'm gonna push this a little further over here, and um, in this window I will get rid of because that's Tampa and Tampa anymore. Okay, so this is sort of what I stare at most of the day, and interact with this over here and open files up, and then uh, there's built-in uh, Git connections and built-in debugger. So now uh, somewhere my simulator started up. Where did that go? Woohoo. Ah, there it is. Okay. Oh, and you shouldn't exactly look at that. Ignore that. Um, um, <laughs> anyway, where's my uh, control for this? We'll just uh, erase all of these. Yes, erase. That way I won't have anything complex. Now it has to reboot the phone, but that won't take long. Did I press the right thing? Should be. Ship. Okay, it's shutting down. Okay. Yes, the app I'm reading for Evergreen has a green background decided by the designer. <laughs> I didn't pick that color. Not that I would mind it, actually. It's not too bad. Okay. So this is time passes. So uh, let me walk through the code as long as we're here. So what it is, and actually I need it to be slightly further over here. Because i got to be able to see the... 80th column. We really don't need to see that other thing there. Okay. And somehow this ended up buried behind that other thing. Well, I'll probably just sketch back and forth with that. Okay. So what this is, is um, this outer framework here comes from material. And that's going to give you sort of the general skin that it's going to look like a material app. I would use Cupertino app if I want an app that had all the look and feel 
of the OS app. And again, that can be controlled by that one library I was talking about where people can, um, you don't only have to do the apps once and it just does the right thing. So let's do this, move this over a little bit. This is a small screen. I wish I had more screens and bigger screens. Um, and so um, I have a title and that's the title that will end up um, on the uh, on the menu bar for the, the first, oh, that'll end up on the, in the name uh, that it's uh, sent to. And I want you to look for a moment at this thing called primary swatch. We're handing a color to it and it's blue. And watch what happens when I change that once I get this thing up and running. Um, and then, so I basically build up my layout by having these, um, these apps for, or these, uh, uh, these widgets. So we have here extend stateful widget, extend state, which is part of this stateful widget. Um, and then they have build methods, which basically lay out everything that's under that widget. So here's a scaffold, which is the structure of a page. So it has places for footer and header and things like that. Um, and everything here, it's stretching into the, um, I bet my audio is going bad, right? Is it it's too hard to hear? Is it horrible? No? I'm reasonable. Horrible? Is that what you're saying? I can't hear you either very well. I said reasonable. That's reasonable, really. I can't mind. It's, it's really crapping out. Um, Oh, we're not uh, saying anything, so that's okay. okay. Let, let me let me quit a few more things here and see if it's okay. Quit that. I th the problem is that when I get close to <clears throat> swapping, it goes bad. Everything goes bad. And like I said, it's only 8 gig instead of 16 gig, so it's a little crazier. I'll just close a bunch of things. Oh, guess what I closed? Hug. No, I didn't. Okay. It's all correct then. Um, Bill, it's past your bedtime. Um, uh, where'd that go? Yeah, I don't know if I can do this because it's for me. I can barely hear it, and it's probably sounding really bad to you. Let me let me just do this silently, but you'll see it, and I'll point out the few things when I get to there. Where did uh, where did my VS Code go? There? Oh. To bring it back up. We'll open in a second. No, nope, that one didn't open the right place. Uh, where did that go? Oh, it's in temp. So it's code. I'm opening it up with terminal code um, slash temp slash um, blue. Okay, so that should be close to the way it was before. We don't care about Discord. We still have Wi-Fi, though. That's good. Um, okay, so we'll start this app. I'll just show you the hot reload. That's the fun part. Okay, there's the code. Now uh, we select this code, and I use an F5. And it will open up a window down here that has my compilation. And this will take probably a couple minutes. So again, this is a really simple app. All it does is it has a counter on the screen with a plus button. And you press the plus button. And it counts up by one. But I want to show you two features of that to illustrate Hot Reload. So now I'm just stalling for time. A little bit at a time. And, uh, oh, no, it's running on iOS. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Stop. Stop. Yeah, it doesn't, it want, doesn't want to do that. It wants to go, I have to do this on there. Oh, I bet now would be a good time for me to put your buds in. Hold on. I think that's partly what's happening is the echo cancellation is getting mixed up by my audio. Yeah, the earbuds are better. Yep, yep. Hold on. Battery on my ear. My jobbers went out at 730. 
Okay, just a second. It's almost done. Where's audio? Audio settings. Um, microphones. Oh, I can't actually change. Uh, that's microphones. Where's our speakers? There we go. Um, Yeti, got it. Okay, this should be a little better. At least I don't think it'll loop back when it, when it breaks. Um, okay, I don't want that. I wanted to do that. Okay, hopefully you guys can still see me, right? Okay, um, so uh, it's now going to build for the iPhone. So we'll go in here again, function five. And it should build in a little less time. But we're watching out there, and it'll eventually show up over here. And I'll also say my uh, the coolest part of this was when Wim showed me Hot Reload. I went home and installed this thing on my on my laptop, and within about thirty minutes, I had an icon on my phone that I did. I know I didn't download from the uh, Apple Store. I had written something that was on my phone. Well, it was a counter app, but at least I was, I had that. I did that. So we're still building it here. Give it a few more seconds. Um, yeah, I think it was echo cancellation that went nuts. So this should make it better. And hopefully you're hearing me mostly correct. But why did, why did that switch to me? Oh, ouch. Um, how do you switch it back to just looking at everybody that talks? I forget how to do that. Oh, that's this thing down here, right? Okay, good. That's back to what it was. Um, still Xcode build. This is what I meant about it just being slow. Uh, that's why sometimes if I had switched this to just be pop up a web page, it would do the same exact thing in about 15 seconds total because compiling for the web is apparently quick, nice and quick. What's also fascinating is this hot reload thing I'm about to show you. They do it by essentially patching into the debugger on your uh, web browser. And then they send down update codes with uh, the debugger. Well, this is, this is brilliant. I usually have this pre-done, so I don't have to do this. Too late, though. All right. Another 30 seconds at most. So what uh, what Flutter did is it first ran all of the necessary tooling to be able to build an OS app, and I didn't I don't know anything about that except for once I have to fix something like the signature ID that I need to uh, send it to someone else. Oh, there it is. So there's my uh, there's my app finally up and running. Now I'll show you how exciting this is. Okay, right. So this is the app. Okay, and watch what it does. It counts. Okay, mm. well, let's say, yeah, woohoo, right, yeah, all this expense, you know, laptops to program this in, everything like that. And there's not even a minus button, so if you go far, you're, it's, you're still already screwed. But let's say I'm deep into my app. In this case, I'm nine clicks into something somewhere deep in menu, menu, menu. And I look up here and I go, you know, we really didn't want blue here. You know what we want? We don't want blue. We want colors green. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you when I hit save, and you'll you'll be amazed. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Boom. So you can be deep into your app and go, no, those, those buttons should be close together. Oh, I forgot this next button. And you can start right where you already are. Notice it didn't lose the nine number there. And that goes for all these things here. Like, uh, for example, there's this text uh, string here. Where is that string? Um, there's center, there's column. And let's say well, it shouldn't have been pushed. It should have been shoved. So, again, three, two, one, go. There, already, I mean, they almost didn't see it. It just blinked. That's the kind of thing you can do is you can be sitting in there iterating 
on your code. You can add another page and then link to it from this page, things like that, uh, all without needing to go through the very long compile cycle. Yes, it has to take a while to do the first time, but every time after that, to let you know, I wanted to actually start the program over. I didn't want any state to be uh, affecting my code. I just go right up here to this little green arrow. Okay, again, three, two, one, go. And now it's reloaded and started over. So that also works well when you're deep in something. Or a few times if you change the globals, uh, this won't rerun the globals. It'll only rerun the state of all the widgets. So you have to work a little bit harder at that. Anyway, okay, there. We did the demo as broken as it was and how long time taking it did. Any more questions before we have to let y'all go? Nope. Everybody's just staring out their screens. Yeah, very good, Randy. It was very interesting. Randall, I yeah. apologize. It's okay. I mean, it's, yeah. <clears throat> and and uh, I'm happy to have been presenting here. And like I said, uh, you can find me all over the place at the, uh, if you go to flutter.dev slash community, uh, I'll be in pretty much everywhere that's listed there. So I'm in the Discord a lot. I'm in uh, Slack a lot. Uh, I'm uh, cruising through Stack Overflow as often as I can. I have RSS feeds for all that. So I just basically go, yes, yes, no, 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 no. Yes, okay, I can answer this one. I can answer this one. And uh, just answer real quickly. But uh, I've got 30,000 Stack Overflow points now. So it's I can do all sorts of other things too, but I don't have time to do anything but answer questions. <laughs> so that's that's it. That's Flutter. I hope you guys will give it a look. And now that it's first-class citizen on at least Ubuntu, uh, should be no problem getting anything set up for you. Ah, a couple of restrictions. Didn't tell you about it. Because of Apple's rules, you need to have a Mac to be able to run the Xcode tools. So you can only build for iOS platform if you have a Mac. You can only build for Windows if you have something emulating Windows or actually is Windows. Uh, and of course, to be able to build for Linux, you have to have uh, either be running on Linux or have a virtual machine with Linux on it. it. Works either way. But that's it. That's the restrictions. Well, hope you enjoyed it. So thanks a lot, guys. Hey, okay, thank you very, very much. Okay. We're out of here. Stop recording. Thanks. We can shut off the uh, live streaming now.